And so I'm really excited about this training because I've just started the process of making educational videos and I feel like there's a lot that I've learned in this short amount of time of trying to put things together and there's a lot of questions that I still have. So I'm really excited about the idea of all of us coming together to sort of crowdsource um, the videos, but also to share lessons learned. <laughs> And I'm Martin Sweeney. I run the immigration clinic at the University of Maryland um, and I'm teaching immigration law there. Uh, so I have a stand up class as well as the clinic. Um, and we have been, um, some I know in the group are uh, part of the, the immigration professors listserv. We've been trying to crowdsource uh, videos on different topics. Uh, we have a Google Doc that I'll, I'll put the link to in the chat. Um, and uh, also, like Nicole, starting to make more recordings myself and also just really enjoying the variety of voices that are coming through with the different videos from different people. And I'm Liz Keys, another immigration clinician and really am the cheerleader and not the contributor, but thank you for including me in the intro, Michelle. I enthusiastically support this. They have done all the work. <laughs> And uh, so thanks everyone. And I'm Michelle Pistone. I, I'm a professor at Villanova and I run a clinic, an immigration clinic also. And um, what I thought I'd do today is just um, share some ideas. I've been making educational videos, as some of you know, for years and have been um, collecting them on a website called Legal Ed Web so that we could crowdsource and share our ideas. And so what I thought I'd do is just start by talking about like the why, like why we should uh, spend time making videos and then the what of educational videos. So the types of topics and the types of videos themselves and then the how, like the logistics and the how to of educational videos. And I know that Liz and Nicole especially have a lot of um, tips and ideas as well. So I'd like to incorporate their ideas. And then at the end, we can talk about uh, we can give you some next steps in terms of uh, the, the project and how we can co collaborate to create a crowdsourced sourced, um, collection of videos that we can all use and share. And so, comma, blueberries, comma, lettuce, so somebody doesn't have their uh, their mute on button on, so just check to make sure that it's on. And the other thing is that you guys should feel free to ask questions in the chat as we go along. And um, Maureen is going to be monitoring the chat and she can interrupt me at any time with questions. I think it's easier to just answer the questions when they come up in the context of the presentation. So in terms of why educational videos, so I think that there are at least five reasons why we should think about making educational videos. I think it's a really efficient use of your time. Um, it supports student engagement, especially online. It supports student learning. It's easily reused and it's a way to incorporate others' voices as, um, as Maureen had mentioned. So in terms of an efficient use of your time, like it's an upfront investment in designing and, and shooting and, and producing the videos, but it really helps you in, um, in it. It could be agile, like in the sense that you can use it for in-person classes, for online classes, and also for blended. So I don't think that you should necessarily think about online videos just in response to like our current situation but think of it as an investment in material that you can use year after year going forward. Um, and so really for me, the guiding question is like, what needs to be taught in person and what could students learn self-paced? And another thing with respect to, to videos that I've made for clinic is to think about the types of questions that my students ask me year after year and that I'm, always kind of giving them bespoke feedback on. And if I just had a video that I can refer them to, or if they knew about a video that they could refer, be referred to, then it would save my, you know, save my time. The other thing is that it supports student learning in that um, 
you know, teaching and learning, as I keep saying, are two different verbs by two different sets of actors. And sometimes as a teacher, we assume that just because we said something in class, the students have learned it. And I myself think that way as well. And I'm like, but I taught them that. And what I find with video is that students can, if we think about it from the student's perspective, we can give them resources that then they can refer to when they need it. So it's kind of related to this notion of like just in time learning. So like, for example, if there's a video on how to prepare for a court hearing, you know, the, the, and that was something that students would learn in the context of their clinic, but then could, could like watch the night before they went to court. It would be something that's accessible to them when they need it, you know, at the time that they need it. And that supports student learning and student engagement. And, um, you know, just to think about the fact that in synchronous online classes, as we all know, we've suffered from Zoom fatigue. And so our students will as well. And to recognize that if we transfer things onto video, it's a way to keep students more engaged in the, um, you know, in the, the stuff that we need to do synchronously. Um, so we know that like it, it also supports learning because students can't, you know, we can't keep their attention online. They're distractible. They want to learn at their own pace. And, um, and so that's related to that. And then the other thing is that we can easily reuse the video content, as I mentioned. So it's a way of using our time um, differently. And if we think about creating videos that are modular, that are like short and, and not necessarily related to other things that we've done in the classroom, then you could use that same video for several different classes. You know, like for example, Maureen, mentioned that she's teaching immigration law and she's also teaching a clinic. So if she were to create a series of videos on topics that are relevant that students need to know in the clinic and their substantive topics, she could also use them if they were modular and like um, re kind of stackable, then she could use them in a class on immigration law and also in her clinic and reuse year after year for various courses. So that's another reason to think about using video. And then it also allows us to bring in others' perspectives and voices. And I would, you know, as you're starting to think about video and kind of building out a video collection for yourself and also for us to share, to think broadly about the types of voices that you might want to include in your, in your course. You know, oftentimes we invite people as guest speakers. So this is like an, a, a way of bringing in those voices semester after semester, where we have them invest once in making a video and then we could use that year after year. So we can include clients' voices or practitioners or judges or, you know, colleagues that teach in, other, in the law school or in other disciplines. So it's another benefit of using video. So that's kind of my why. I really want to make sure that you see all the value of it. And then in terms of making videos, there are several different types of videos that you can make. And then I wanted to talk a little bit about the learning content that you can include in videos and what to include. So in terms of the types of videos, um, so videos should always, I think, align with what your learning goals are for the course. And so they could be on legal doctrine or foundational topics. So, you know, for me, I teach an asylum clinic and I spend so much time at the beginning of the semester. We do an orientation and it's really intense, it's usually an in-person orientation and it's really intense. And um, we're there for like, you know, three days in a row for five hours a day. And as I started thinking about video, I realized that, that there's some of the kind of upfront legal doctrine and foundational topics that my students need to know in order to be effective in a clinic that, it, that I could shift into video. And then I would have them watch those videos as homework and then come into the live session where we could either talk about it or move on to something else. So it actually made 
the orientation shorter because I could move some of those things to video and again, could reuse them in other classes that I taught. It could also be a, a preview. So you could have a video um, that talks about something so that before students read it, I'm sorry about that. So before students read something, they, they watch the video and it kind of suggests that they should think about certain topics while they're doing the reading. Or you could do an overview of topics or sections. You could have interviews and we've used this a lot in Clinic where we have interviews and we have role plays and demos, but also we can have those interviews with like guest speakers, outsiders, even clients that talk about like the client perspective. I think that could be really helpful. I don't have that yet, but as I started putting together this PowerPoint, I thought, wouldn't it be cool to like have a collection of, of short videos from former clients, you know, who are now citizens, but have them talk about what it felt like to come into the office for the first time and have the students hear that. I think that could be really powerful um, as a way of creating empathy and helping students to see that first interview from the perspective of a client, which is, of course, one of our primary goals in clinical education. So this is an example of a video that is, um, you know, just an intro about writing and it's see if I have it. Wait, hold on. Here it is. Is everyone seeing my screen? Yes? Okay. IRAC or CREAC or CRACSAC, the building blocks of legal analysis. You may have heard the terms used already in class. What is an IRAC or a CREAC or a CRACSAC? This is merely a way to organize your legal analysis. Why do you need to use it? So as you can see, this is an example of a video uh, that was made for legal writing. And another benefit of creating these types of videos is that you can incorporate the voices of your, your, your colleagues into your clinic. So they've, you know, the students have learned these topics in 1L legal writing. And then in the clinic, you can give them a video to like remind them of these fundamental things before they engage in later go writing themselves. And so that's an example of a type of video, sorry. And then um, this is an example of, of another type of video on confidentiality. Confidentiality. Rule 1.6 sets forth the attorney's ethical obligation of confidentiality. The first thing to know is what the obligation covers. It covers everything the lawyer learns as a result of her representation of the client. Everything the client tells the attorney, everything the attorney learns about the client's matter as she investigates the case, any information which the attorney possesses related to the representation, is covered by the attorney's obligation to maintain confidentiality. Comment two sets forth the rationale behind attorney-client confidentiality. So that's another example of a video that you could incorporate into your teaching or even you know, have students watch outside of class before they engage, for example, in their first client interview. And also it's a way of engaging other colleagues, like in your, another example of how to bring other colleagues into your course. So you could have a colleague who, special, who teaches lawyering profession, um, you know, make videos that they use in their course, and then you could also use them in yours. And so in terms of types of educational videos, Um, there are a few different ways that you could make, edu make videos. So one would be a talking head or lecture where you use the programs that you have on your computer and just record yourself talking about a short topic. Or you could use, um, sometimes I use my um, iPhone because I like the camera in the iPhone and I could just record a, a 
video through the iPhone and then upload it onto my, um, into my learning management system or onto YouTube. You could also do a voice over PowerPoint. And so PowerPoint has uh, the capability to record your voice. And there, I just wanted to mention that you could, while you're, while you're talking, you could use the pen function to circle things that you're talking about on the PowerPoint. Um, you could also do a computer screen recording. So that's just a recording of what's on your screen with a voiceover. So it doesn't have your, your visual on it. Or you could do an interview. Sorry, I keep moving through this too quickly. You could do an interview where you even interviewed someone like on Zoom and recorded it and then made that an, you know, a video that you could assign. Prezi also now has the ability to, you can use voiceover and record a video through Prezi or um, this technology that I've used, um, Whiteboard, and I'll show you that video. It's a little bit more advanced, but, um, but that's another option as well. And there are other things as, out there as well. So this is an example of a talking head video. So this is um, Hiroshi Motomura who's a law professor, and he's talking about the history of immigration. There is a huge fundraising deadline coming up for Senate Democrats, and they need your help right now if they're An important part of American history is the history of immigration in this country. And a key part of the immigration history of this country are two places that are quite storied in the history books. One of them is Ellis Island in New York Harbor, and the other, less well known, is Angel Island in San Francisco Bay. And they tell uh, a lot about the history of immigration in this country. And I think it's worth spending a minute to try to figure out how they were. So that's a video that I uh, worked on in collaboration with Forward. Um, which is a not-for-profit organization that is, you know, works on immigration-related issues. And we basically brought a camera to an immigration professor's meeting, like an improv workshop that we had. And people, you know, I invited people ahead of time to, to be prepared to make these videos. And so that's another idea to think about, like, as you, um, whenever we are again in the same place, to think about like using that opportunity to create a collection of videos. Michelle? Yeah. Uh, this is Maureen. I just, I just um, we have a question in the chat about uh, that, the video on confidentiality that you had. So maybe uh, at some point we can, we can link the, uh, post the link to it into the chat. I just posted actually the link in the chat. Very good. Um, where you can find that in a bunch of other videos. And so this is another example of a talking head video. This is a video that I recorded in Villanova. And uh, Ruth Ann Robbins is a colleague who teaches legal writing at Rutgers. And she came to Villanova to, to create a series of videos for me that I use in a program. Um, she's an expert in storytelling. And I like to incorporate concepts of storytelling into my clinic course because my students are telling stories through their affidavits and also you know through their cases and so she created a series of five short videos for me on storytelling and this is an example of one of them in this video i'm going to talk about the role of storytelling to legal advocacy and explain why it is integral to legal advocacy. And to do that, I'm going to talk about the nature and cognition of story and why that matters to legal analysis. So to start us out, I wanna give you a definition of story. And that is a descriptive telling of a character's efforts over time to reach a goal. Now there are a lot of definitions of stories if you, in this video, so that's an example of um, a video that I can use in a lot of my courses because I think that storytelling is important and she made it once, she came to, to, to campus, made it once and I can reuse it semester after semester. 
And then this is well, an example. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. We have a question about, is there some tool that allows you to move back and forth between talking head videos and PowerPoint? Um, I think you'd have to do that in the editing process. So you could record a talking head and then you could, um, well, I guess you could incorporate like media site allows you to both see the talking head and the video and the PowerPoint at the same time. And media site might be a program that you have access to at your school. I know that we have access to it at, at Villanova. So that might be an option for you. And the student would see both the PowerPoint and the person talking. Another, another thing is that you can actually use Zoom to do this. So for example, um, me and my, my co-teacher were both on Zoom together and had it so that we were going back and forth between sharing our screen and that and had our um, Zoom meeting that was just the two of us recorded. And that was another way in which to create content. Um, and that was really, I, I found that to be really easy for someone who maybe is a little bit wary about trying out new, you know, tools and just wants to do sort of something that you're already comfortable with. Most, most people are comfortable with using Zoom and PowerPoint. So that might be a nice, um, a nice way to do that. And I can share um, the video link so you can see how that's done. And then another thing for folks who have um, Max, it's really pretty easy to use the iMovie as well as a way in which to sort of do some of the editing so that if you were, for example, recording yourself on your iPhone, but then wanted to have go back and forth and use just a PowerPoint or an image, you can sort of easily splice those together. And then lastly is that some, I know at the University of Baltimore and some other schools have um, Panopto is another method for recording. And that has some tools as well in terms of being able to go back and forth between sort of the, the talking head and the PowerPoint. Yeah, and I really like the idea of starting with something that you're already familiar with. So Nicole's idea of starting with Zoom I think if you're already using Zoom, to just test that out as an option at the beginning would be great. And even, I'm assuming, Nicole, that that would work equally well if it was just you talking with the, you know, over your PowerPoint and recording yourself. Yeah. Another, another one too that's, I think, free for a lot of people if you um, have the, if your school has the educational subscription is Adobe Spark. Um, which is another way where you can record video clips and you can re record audio. And you just have to be mindful that it's only 30 second clips. So if you were gonna be talking, you would have to just make multiple little slides. Um, there's a, they have like a training video that you can watch that explains how to do it. But that's another pretty easy way to create something that goes back and forth between different mediums and it does all the work for you. And yeah. if I could just jump in um, quickly, uh, you, we need to be mindful of how much space these things take up on our computers. So the ideal that we've been practicing at UB is to um, uh, do the recording and then upload to our learning management system immediately because this can add up, especially as we integrate slides and video and audio and all of it going back and forth. Yeah, and, and if you want to, um have your videos available as part of our crowdsourcing function you could send the videos to us and then we can upload them onto youtube and then you won't have to have it on your that's another way for it not to live on your computer that you can then have the link and you can incorporate that into your learning plan. that's a really important point because um, the data does take up a lot of space on your computers so this is an example of a video that I created. It's a voiceover PowerPoint. And I decided to use this technology for this particular video because I was teaching students how to analyze a statute. And I wanted to have the text of the statute available for them to look at. And so I used, um, I used this voiceover PowerPoint function. Let me see if I can get to that. Michelle, a 50-year-old health practitioner is begging women to stop wasting money on eye creams. Sorry, 
no, that's fine. Just as you're transitioning here, we had a question in the chat um, about having some kind of a disclaimer that legal information can become outdated, that it shouldn't be relied on as legal advice. Um, so I posted some uh, sample language that we suggested in the improv um, catalog uh, as that kind of disclaimer. Obviously, you can uh, customize it to your own um, to your own needs. Yeah, and so this is um, that power voiceover PowerPoint video. Hi, it's Professor Pistone here, and today we're going to talk about analyzing a statute. So we're going to use an immigration statute, the Statute for Temporary Protected Status, or TPS. So our learning goals are that by the end of this video, you'll have an understanding about how to interpret an immigration statute, how to, you, Let me it would be to read the is the arrow is pointing to the bottom you can click on the text box and that will so the, I like doing a point voiceover PowerPoint for some videos where it's technical and I want students to see like specific language or specific parts of a website here so here I'm teaching the stu students how to research immigration law from government info and I wanted to use that arrow and um, you know, here again, I wanted to, I circled particular texts that I wanted them to see. And so you can do that with PowerPoint. Um, again, you know, this is another part that I wanted to, that I was highlighting for them. So I put it into this circle. So this is just an example of using PowerPoint when it's text heavy or when there are specific things that you want to address and, and show students and you want to incorporate an image or a picture from a website. And so this is an example of a screen capture video. So I have this form on my computer and I wanted to talk about how to fill out the form. And so I just recorded what was on my screen. It was, it captured what was on my screen and I just did a voiceover. So this is an example of that. And today I wanna to talk about learning content and the type of information that we might be able to put onto video. So we wanna think about chunking up videos so that students can supplement what they hear in a lecture with video content. So thinking about if your learning goal is that you want the students to be able to list the elements of a claim, then one of the things that you could do to develop learning content would be to create a video with a description of the elements of the claim. So elements of a tort or of a contract, whatever it is that you're trying to teach them, you might be able to create a video that explains or details the elements of the claim. Another example is if you want the students to be able to align facts to the elements of a claim, then you could create a video that talks about the elements and the kinds of facts that would support those elements. So, the so you can see that that's a little chunky and like the, you can hear the, the typing because I'm actually recording what's happening on my video. And I think if I were to redo it, I would probably um, make it so that the, the, the uh, timing was a little bit faster because it turns out that I was speaking slowly because I was typing and talking at the same time. But I can speed that up in post-production. And it's something that you should know that you can do in post-production, you can speed up the, uh, the pace of the, of the audio. 
Michelle, if you don't mind my interrupting, we've had a question. The previous, I think it was the previous slide that you showed, um, or the previous video yeah, about the TPS requirements. Um, the question was, were you, did you circle that in PowerPoint or was that a YouTube video of the text that you had circled somehow? Yeah, so I circled it in PowerPoint. And um, I used one of the shapes in PowerPoint to create the circle. And then I just had that as a, you know, on the second slide. Like, so I'd have one slide maybe with just the text, and then I'd move to the second slide and it would have the circle on it. In Great. PowerPoint, you can also use a pen, which is another function that you could use if you're doing a voiceover PowerPoint. But I tend to, um, it's harder for me. I don't have a tablet attached to my computer. So when I use a pen, like it's not as straight. And so I prefer this, but it, you could use the pen as well. And today I want to. And so this is an example of a whiteboard video. And it's, I use this pro program called Video Scribe, and it does take some time to get to, um, to get familiar with the program. I wouldn't suggest it for those of you who are new to making videos, um, but it's just another example of what you can do with video. And, and I'll just show a little bit of this if I can. Hold on. I don't know if I have this queued up. I don't have this one queued up, I'm sorry, but it's available on Legal Ed. And, Nicole, I'm sure you could send them the link to it. And basically it's, it's a hand that moves across the screen and it writes things as you talk. But it takes some practice to get used to using the technology and then also uh, timing everything so that it works well. Maureen and I have both used this and um, it is very time consuming. So I would recommend that if you're going to make a video uh, using VideoScribe, that it be on a topic that's not going to change over time. And one thing to note that I didn't realize until, until I was like almost halfway done through making a video, if you think that you're going to sort of game the system by doing their free, they have like a one week free trial, just know you can use it to make videos, but then it creates sort of a watermark on the back that makes that says that it's free, you know, a free trial. Um, and so it sort of takes away a little bit from the video. So um, just to like just to highlight that for folks who maybe thought they could be sneaky and get all of their videos done in a week. <laughs> so in terms of the learning content that I think, I mean, there's so many things that we can use video for. Um, as I mentioned, like summarize an area of substantive law or a component of substantive law, explain the holding of the case, describe the historical context of a case or a policy, um, an, a how-to, like how to engage in analysis or problem solve or conduct research or interview a client or prepare for an interview or prepare for a hearing. Like there's so many um, how-to practice tips, ethical considerations, like we talked about, legal doctrine, foundational topics, a preview um, of a case, an overview of topics, interviews with outsiders, role plays, demos. Um, other things that I've thought about um, for clinic in particular is there's a lot of content for, for us that we deliver to our, to our students about office procedures, like in an office manual, and it's, it's a written manual. Some of those topics, I would love to see us incorporate them into short videos that would be like a library of things that like, so that it would be accessible to students when they needed to know how to do something that related to, um, related to like the, the office procedures in the clinic, how to start a new file for a client and even walk through how, you know, like a, uh, that would be, I think a good example where you could do a screen capture and you could actually show the students how to create a new file in your learning manage in your um, case management system, for example. Um, and I would, in terms of like where to start and how to use your time most efficiently, I would prioritize what I call slam dunk topics with the most longevity. So, you know, there are some things that um, 
change over time. And those aren't necessarily the places where you want to start, but there are probably a lot of topics that are foundational and that you talk about semester after semester and you use year after year in your clinics. And that would be, I think, the place to start. So the video that I just showed you was the five stages of a client interview. You know, those are things that are not going to change over time, the theory might change and evolve a little, but not you know, significantly. So that's the type of topic that I would suggest um, starting with. I've done a, I did a series of videos on um, persuasion. So ethos, pathos, logos. Again, those are topics that are not gonna change over time or storytelling, you know, but then, um, so those are the things that I would suggest that you um, prioritize. So topics that are unlikely to change and that are you know foundational or skills based practice tips perspectives from outsiders or topics that students always get stuck on so if there's something that like you know year after year you tell students again and again that might be a good topic for a video michelle if i could just jump in it's also um for me been really helpful to start with something really small so i took one piece of one class just to get over that initial fear of, oh my gosh, this is all new technology and how does this work with this? And what I figured out is that first of all, what I think of as small ends up being sort of an appropriate eight to 10 minute video, but it also got me over sort of all my technology fears really quickly. And um, it was easy then to jump into the next ones. Yeah, that's a great tip. And so that leads into what I want to say about making the videos. And Liz said, like, you want to keep them short. And so eight minutes is a really ideal time, length of time for a video. And um, you can think about it in terms of chunks. So there might even be a topic that you think would take more than 10 minutes or eight minutes to talk about, but there might be a way for you to break it up into shorter topics or shorter subtopics. So an example of that is, as I mentioned, I did this series um, of videos on ethos, pathos, and logos. So I think it's important in my clinic to teach persuasion. And that's a topic that's not going to change over time. And it's easy to put on video and have students watch outside of class. So I created one video that talks generally about persuasion and ethos, pathos, and logos. And then I did a separate video on each of those three elements. So one on ethos, one on pathos, and one on logos. So that's an example of how to chunk up a video or you know, chunk up a, a topic into several smaller videos because the research is really clear that you know, we all have shorter attention spans when we're watching online and eight to 10 minutes is really the sweet spot. So try to keep it in that uh, sweet spot if you can. Of course, there's some things that could go over, but um, that's the preference. And then as you're creating um, your, especially your PowerPoint, I would think about preferencing graphics over text. There are some times when you need to use text but if you can even reinforce it with a graphic, that's always very helpful. You know, there's a lot of uh, research on, um, and I know that there's controversy on like a preference in terms of how students learn. Like, are they visual learners or are they kinesthetic learners? But we all learn in different ways. And so to the extent that you can include graphics, you're reaching people who, who will remember that graphic and you can um, use the text or read, read. and what I, what I mean about reading the text aloud is that um, we have both an auditory track and a visual track. And when we're reading, we use our auditory track. So if we expect our students to read the text in front of them, um, you have to either be silent and give them time to read it out loud, to read it to themselves, or you read it out loud to them. I'm sure you've been in this situation where you've been in a conference or a presentation and the presenter has a lot of text on the screen and they're also talking at you and like you don't know where to focus. And that's because of this audit, auditory and visual track and you can't use both of them at the same time when you're trying to read. 
Um, and then to also think about ha having each video stand alone so that um, it's not like, what I mean by that is you don't, you want to think about using videos more like often, using them again and again. So you don't want to necessarily tie them to something that you've done in a particular class on a particular day. So as an example, you don't want to necessarily said yet say something in your video like yesterday in class we spoke about X and today in this video we're going to we're going to like go into a related topic. Just keep the first part of it about how you spoke about X in class out and just start with the topic so that it stands alone and it's not linked to something that you did in class and then it can be reused not only by you but by colleagues. And then um, I like to think about structuring, like I put some time before I engage in making a video, I, I spend some time thinking about how I want to organize it and how I want to organize the material so that it's accessible to students in a structured way. And I'll show you some of the tips I use for that. And then this last thing is to just be yourself and have fun and to it's true, like it is daunting to start making videos. And um, I think, you know, like having your personality come through is very attractive, it, it draws students in. And so I just want to encourage you to figure out how you can do that in your own videos. And I saw Liz and Nicole shaking their heads, so I don't know if you have anything to add on that. I guess what I would add is just sort of know yourself and know what your own sort of like quirks are. So for example, I was getting really, really hung up with how I looked in the videos because I was never looking directly at the camera. I always seemed to be staring off screen. And so I was spending all of this time re-recording the same like 15 seconds over and over again until finally I decided, you know what, I'm just going to switch for now to doing a voiceover because I feel much more comfortable with that. And then once I got comfortable with that, then I was able to switch back to an actual sort of talking head thing. So I think that's one thing to keep in mind is know your quirks, know whether or not you want to have sort of the crutch, I guess, in some ways of a script. And if you do, then maybe you're using a different type of platform. Um, and so that that was really helpful for me as I was putting together my first videos. And for me, I I thought I needed to be somebody different on video. It felt more formal um, and I'm not a very formal person. Um, and once I realized I could still crack a stupid joke once in a while on video or ad lib, um, everything just went so much better. No. I, for me, I don't know about for the students. <laughs> and just one other uh, tip um, on Nicole's point about where you're looking. Um, if you if you find a way to put your text near where your camera is and you're using your text that will allow you to then be looking at least close to where the camera is right yeah and you also want to think about how um how to position yourself in the screen so if it is a talking head um you want to like elevate my computer is on top of a book because i wanted it I wanted my eyes to be at the same height as the camera. So a lot of people sometimes when they're making videos and they're sitting above the computer, it might look something like this, where you're just looking at my neck or the top of my chin. I don't really even have a neck, frankly. Um, my chin and the ceiling. So what I've done is I've moved the camera so that I'm in the center and it's at the height that I want it to be. So those are just, that's just a tip in terms of if you're doing a recording of your own face. So this is a website that I use for um, when I think about organization and structure. And I use this a lot in my PowerPoint slides because I want to, um, I want to use visuals to help to reinforce the messages that I want to that I want to convey to students. And depending, and so this is a website in the bottom left, and we can Nicole, maybe you can send that link to people. It's diagrammer.com. So um, Nancy Duarte is she she did this really good TED talk, and she um, is an expert in uh, presentations. 
and she created this website called Diagrammer, and it's all available for free, but it helps you to think about how to structure the concepts that you want to share with students. And so you can see that there's all these different ways that ideas connect. And if you figure out the way that your ideas connect, is it a loop or is it linear? Is it hooked? Uh, they overlap, like ethos, pathos, logos are three overlapping circles when in the center is where you want to be. And so once you figure out if one of these structures can help you, then you can dig deeper into the website and actually come like tell then figure out how many nodes you have so how many concepts you have and then diagrammer will give you um ex templates that you can use to create a powerpoint slide using the um ideas the 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 the, the nodes and the flows that you that you want to use and then I also just wanted to point out that it's all, this is also available in PowerPoint. So if you go to PowerPoint, you can see this um, different ways that you can, that the ideas relate to each other and they have some options on PowerPoint. So you wouldn't even have to adopt them from, from uh, Diagrammer if you wanted to use PowerPoint. And so here, if you go to insert and then um, that little icon, then you'll have the drop down with all these different ways of organizing your, your ideas. I'm not sure if this is gonna, um, I don't think I have this video um, hooked up either. So I might as well just skip over this. I'm sorry, I forgot to, to hook it up today. So now I just wanted to talk a minute, bit, a minute about the logistics of making videos. And I think we're doing, we have a few more minutes. Um, so again, like decide your style, conversational or more polished. For me, I prefer having a conversational style because it means I don't have to redo the video more. <laughs> I can just kind of accept that it's not going to be perfect and just move on. And so let my, maybe it's a way of also letting my personality come through. Um, I usually prepare notes and you can actually, there are apps that you can um, upload in your tablet that you can use as a teleprompter. So if you wanted to have your notes, then you could use that as a, you know, it can move through the notes for you. And again, like Maureen said, if you decide to do that, you want to put the tablet close to where your camera is so that you're looking at the camera while you're reading the notes. And I just learned, and someone else might be familiar with this, that there's a clip that you can attach to your screen that will hold your tablet. And so you can actually connect it to, um, to your computer. And then that will help you to keep your, your focus on the camera. And there was I a great, sorry, there was a great suggestion in the chat a couple of minutes ago about using a music stand. If any musicians are out there and have a music stand, that's you know terrific to place your, your paper notes or another screen right behind you where you're looking. Yeah, perfect. And then um, the face in the center I talked about, and I would just recommend that you test the equipment first. I have an example of using a microphone that like was very, it wasn't clear. And I got a lot of comments from students in my comments. <laughs> Next time, check the mic first. So I would, that's my lesson learned for everyone. <laughs> and then, in go ahead. Sorry, one, one quick question from the chat is, um, your opinion on using a Zoom background, does that give nice consistency or is it boring? I personally don't love those backgrounds because when you move, it's kind of awkward sometimes. So I would, I tend to not like to use them, but I can see depending on where you are, if you don't have a space that you can use, um, you know, a, a background that you prefer, I could see where that could be helpful. 
or you know some people i guess are using it so that they have their their school's logo in the background i could see that being an option liz liz has suggested in the chat that she has a picture of her office just to make it seem like she's sitting in her office it also makes it far far less likely that one of my my animals will wander through the back of the video oh right so that's yeah that's a good point and then the, i think there's a for those of you who are using the backgrounds i think that there are tips so maybe the clothing that you wear, like you should wear a shirt that has a distinctive color from the background. And I think that way it doesn't like morph into it the way you sometimes see. Is that right? Does anyone know the tip for that? I have seen those tips, but I don't really know them because I haven't used them. Yeah. So I, if you're going to use a background, I would suggest just looking for those tips so that you know how to prepare yourself so that you don't morph into the background when you move. Um, so in terms of using time efficiently, I just wanted to point out a few things that I've learned and I'm sure, you know, Nicole and everyone else have other ideas as well. But I have found that um, if I make a video close in time to when I'll use it or when I'm going to teach it the first time, it's very helpful because I kind of, I'm, I'm already in the flow. And so I find that it's more efficient for me to do it then. Um, so like it's right. And that's because it's fresh in my mind. It's an easier lift if I do it as part of a class prep and I kind of see it as an extension of a class prep. So sometimes like I'll teach it in class and then right afterward I'll videotape it. So I have that like in my library for the next time I'm going to teach it. And again, it's because I'm benefiting from that flow rather than having to sit down and think about all the videos I want to make for the whole semester and doing them all right now, that would be really daunting to me. But if I did it incrementally, like for example, I, I'm creating an asynchronous course. So that course is entirely, you know, like it's, it's running, it's going to start running and, and I'm not going to be involved. But, but one, what I did was I wanted to create a short video at the beginning of each unit so that the students knew what the unit was about. And I recorded that video after I had done the whole curriculum and I had put the whole curriculum together and I had like read it, like just to make sure it was all perfect. And then right after that, when it was all fresh in my mind, I created these short videos, each of which is like maybe three or four minutes long, but which were intros to each of the units. And I found that that was really helpful because I had that, I was like taking advantage of that flow because it was like in my head, I had just prepared it. And so I would just think that you're like, to make it a for, fall goal rather than a summer goal, <laughs> you know, like this is the kind of thing that you can do as you're going through the semester. And as you're about to teach something, just like ask yourself, is this something I can do on video? And if it is, make a video then. I'd love to just emphasize that to lower people's stress levels, because I'm sure some people are listening to you thinking, yeah, but Michelle's the expert at this. It's so easy for her. And I also thought I need to do my whole class this summer because that's what the real you know, online teachers do. And as soon as I started making little short videos, I realized, oh, this is actually going to be really easy to do during the semester. And that goal of getting an entire class onto video by August 24th, I let it go. So to the extent others on the call are really stressed out about having that kind of goal, please listen to what Michelle just said. It's true. Yeah, and I would just emphasize like this library hopefully will be accessible for you going forward. So like it's an investment now, but it's going to be helpful. And even for things that you're teaching synchronously, if there's a way to make a video and make it into asynchronous for next time, that's going to be a benefit to you. So another uh, thing that I've done is when I, so, so recently, I presented on how to use X, I presented at a conference on how to use experts in asylum cases. And I created this PowerPoint. And then right afterward, I thought I can make that into a series of three videos. And so I had just presented it. It was fresh in my mind. And then I created the three videos. So that's another thing to think about. 
even if you're yeah. presenting to other audiences, are there things that you can then use that energy to create into a video for your own class? Yeah, and I have an even la lazier way to do it. I just um, did a, a webinar for my school that was recorded um, on the DACA decision from the Supreme Court. And I got the video from them afterwards and just cut out my part of it, put a title on it and use that. It's a little long. It's, it's about 20 minutes, which is really longer than you want it to be. But if you want to, that's now on the list. So if somebody wants kind of the background on that case, it's up there. All right, I'm going to use it. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's how this works. Yeah, exactly. So just so you know, it is about three minutes to two. All right. And um, this is test equipment for us. I don't need to show you this. But um, this is, this is um, I created this website a while ago called Legal Ed. And it has, this is where we're going to be hosting uploading the videos if you want to share it with the community. And there are a lot of videos on here that you might be able to use in your own teaching. And then um, I just wanted to end by saying that we don't have to do this alone. Like we're a community and we can support each other. And, um, you know, we can collaborate, which is fun. And it, it, it helps to, I think, reinforce our community, especially at this time when we're not seeing each other in person, where we can at least see each other through video and incorporate our co colleagues' voices into our classes too, which is really fun.